that should cover all of us and please do not let go okay we all stand together let's worship the Lord one more time Good morning, everybody. So as you, uh, as you have heard, Pastor Steve is uh, on his way up to the White Mountains right now, enjoying some much, much, much needed uh, relaxation. So keep him in your prayers that uh, it would just be a, a blessing to him that he has some, uh, some good quality time there. So we have been uh, doing a series for the past uh, four weeks called Not a Fan. Uh, quick recap in case you've missed any of them. Week one was called Fan or Follower. 
uh, and that was where we kind of de decided what the, what the terms were. And the idea is, is that a fan is somebody who really likes Jesus, who really likes God, likes his laws, likes his process, but is not necessarily completely sold out to him, not ready to follow him and give everything to him. Week two, we discussed who is called a follower, and it turns out everybody. There's no sin too big to commit that bars you from following Jesus. Very good news. Week three, we discussed uh, knowing Jesus, and we learned that there's a certain intimacy that we share with our Lord and our Creator uh, in following Him as, as a blessing, that we, we get to know Him in, in very detailed ways, and that uh, there's this, this special closeness, a special bond that we share with Him. All wonderful things. Then uh, week four, we had uh, the uh, title was Bury the Dead. That was where things kind of started getting tricky, because then we want to see a little bit more about what are we supposed to do. Well, Paul says several times, put away the old man, and the idea is, is we've got to put away all these old things that we associated with ourselves, these old sinful ways, uh, including our old plans, our own old ideas, and we have to wholeheartedly follow the Lord. That means, in addition to giving up certain sins, we give up everything. In addition to giving up certain plans, we give up all of them, and we follow the Lord's plans. Now, the blessing behind that is if we are doing what the Lord wants us to do, he's going to bless us, and there's no stopping us. If we are in his will, nothing's going to stop us. So that brings us to this week. Now, the title is Dead Men's Bones. That's going to make sense in probably about 15 minutes or so here. But uh, suffice it to say, this week we're actually going to talk a little about, about the law. So Jesus has forgiven us. We are forgiven for all of our trespasses against the law, but the law is still there. It still plays some sort of a, a role. And it's kind of hard, especially as Christians, to grasp that, what that role is. So that's what this is going to be about. <clears throat> now, we like our rules. We like our laws. And you can't say we don't, uh, especially here in the U.S. Uh, it turns out that uh, as of January 1st, 2010, for just that one year, there were 40,627 new laws entered into the books on January 1st. That's a lot of laws. Split it apart by states, and you still have almost a thousand laws. Uh, again, in 2012, we had just over 40,000 new laws entered onto the books. It seems to be that way every single year. So I have to ask you: Can you think of a new law that happened over the past year? Just one, let alone the 800 and some odd. If you do the division of the states, there's there's a lot of new laws coming on here. This is uh, something that we tend to enjoy, apparently. You ever seen a, a storefront window with a ton of signs and you've got just rules everywhere, pretty much no fun. We've got you know, no loitering, no smoking, no food or drinks, no atten unattended children, no free funds, no pets, no firearms, no knives, no backpacks, no skateboarding, no shirt, no shoes, no service. That's, that's good, you know, these all have purposes, but can't we just have one sign? One sign to cover them all? I found one, I thought this was brilliant. <laughs> It's brilliant, because that's what the laws are getting to, right? All, all of these are, are summed up pretty easy. So, I mean, got to love these guys uh, putting that together. So the, the rules are good, but they're, they're a means, not an end. Uh, they, they accomplish something good, and it's easy to get kind of lost inside of the, uh, the intricacies of the laws themselves. Uh, you take driving rules, for example. Um, every single law out there here in the state of Arizona and everywhere else is to prevent you from hurting yourself or hurting other people. They make sense. Um, but we kind of have our pet laws that we're willing to pass on or maybe twist a little bit. Is there, out of curiosity, is there anybody in here that follows all of the driving laws? Maybe there are. Is there any, anybody? Really? You guys are horrible. You're bad. I, I, I expect at least one hand because I you know, occasionally find somebody who follows all of the laws and that's, that's good. But uh, I, I unfortunately wound up in traffic school a couple years back. And the instructor started the course off. He had a book thicker than our Bible. And he said, this is the Arizona Revised Statutes for Driving Law only. Not all the other laws on the Arizona books. And he thumped it down on the table. And he says, chances are you break these laws without even realizing it. 
Ironically enough, I was in traffic school because I did not realize that it was against the law to drive faster than the person in the lane next to you while you're in a school zone. I was going under the 15 miles an hour, I was doing about 10, but there was a guy to my right that slowed down to about five and I passed right by him and he said, that's not allowed, that's what the no passing on the sign means. I had no idea. I broke this law, I, I had to pay the penalty and everything, I had no idea that I was breaking it. It was one of those obscure laws in that book. Now, it's, it's impossible to obey the rules, but we also like to twist them. Um, how many of you do the 10 over the speed limit or the 5 over the speed limit rule? Sorry if I've passed you. <laughs> it's it's kind of rough, you know, and we start getting these ideas where, well, the, the, they're not going to give you a ticket unless it's at least 11 over the speed limit. So we see a 40 mile an hour, and we, we think in our mind, 50 mile an hour, right? We start kind of manipulating this law. It's not what it says, but in our mind, that's, that's kind of the way it works. Now, we think that by following laws, they make us good. And, and the people in Jesus' time felt the same way. They had all sorts of rules, most of them from the Lord himself, but then others that were derivatives of certain rules and, and so on. So they, they had their set of laws to follow. And by following these laws, they felt that makes us holy. Jesus explained, that, however, that nobody was keeping the law. Sort of like this big book of laws that we break without even realizing, Jesus pointed out that people are manipulating the law for one, and that they are possibly even breaking laws that they didn't even realize, intentional or not. Uh, he covers a lot of this in Matthew chapter 5, and it's this, uh, this series on his uh, sermon where he says, you have heard it said, but I say. And he's talking about various different laws that existed, but then what he says as the creator of our universe, what he says the law really is. So he starts off, he says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. It takes the murder thing a lot further. It sets the standard a lot higher than I think people realize. Here they are maybe manipulating it, saying, well, murder's okay in certain circumstances, maybe the Lord would understand. But he says, no, even anger in your heart against your brother without reason is the same thing. He sets the bar quite a bit higher, not lower. He goes on, he says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You have heard it said, whoever divorces his wife let him give her a certificate of divorce. So there was a problem where there would be a divorce, and without the certificate of divorce, she couldn't move on with her life. She was still legally bound to this man. So this was actually a very cruel practice to have this divorce without a decree. But Jesus, of course, sets the bar higher. He says, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. He says, don't divorce. Forget the certificate. We don't need to get that far. Don't divorce. You have heard it said, you shall not swear falsely. But I say, do not swear at all. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Sounds fair. But I say, I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Turn the other cheek. You have heard it say, said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. So what is Jesus doing here? Is he taking the law and redefining it? Is he changing it around on us? It's been around for, for quite a long time, and he comes through and says, well, this is what this means now. He's not. He's actually describing the intent of the law. Don't be a jerk. Don't commit murder. Not because murdering a person is bad, but the anger and the, the deceit in somebody's heart that leads to murder is bad. It's, it's, this, it's the means. We like to walk this line and see what we can get away with. We, we like to look for the loopholes. They're not going to cite me unless I do this much of a breaking of the law. We have corporations who will hire lawyers and spend a lot of money, tax lawyers, and they go through and they try to find all the loopholes and make it so that their taxes pay the least amount possible. It's perfectly legal, it's within the law, but it's, it's 
it's, it's working around and trying to find these various different loopholes. It's twisting the law. The intention of the tax law is to make everybody pay a certain share of their profits to the government for the good of the country. That's, that's tax law in general, but it doesn't quite work out that way because we end up with this list of rules and then each person looks at that and says, no food, no drinks, but they didn't say anything about gum. And you have a store shop with gum tucked up underneath the bookshelves. They're looking for those loopholes. That's why there's so many signs. We keep trying to seal up these other loopholes because in our heart, in our flesh, we try to find ways around these things. Now, Jesus has a very, very strong warning against these technicalities. And uh, we're actually going to go through Matthew chapter 23. Uh, I was looking around for, for some sermon notes and everything and found out, well, Jesus already wrote it, so you can't go wrong with the word of God himself. So we're going to go through Matthew chapter 23 here. Now, in chapter 23, he's addressing scribes and Pharisees. Now, these guys knew the law very well. They were in charge of maintaining and, and writing through and making copies and knowing scripture in and out. Uh, they were respected holy people. Uh, people look to them for guidance in following God's law. And in fact, they were fans of God's law. They knew every single intricacy. Think of it as, as maybe sort of religious lawyers. They knew everything there was to know about it. Now, Jesus is addressing them. We'll start off uh, right here in verse 1. He says, uh, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. Uh-oh. We're getting off to a really bad start right here. These guys are the holy guys in charge of God's word here to, to these extents, and, and he's saying, don't do as they do. Continues on, for they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So he's calling out two problems. Jesus said, my burden is light. So if they're binding heavy burdens, they're adding to the law. And that's something we kind of like to do, isn't it? You know, we take a, a, a sign and we want it to cover other things. We say, that means this as well. Start manipulating things for their benefit. But uh, he also said they're hypocrites. They, they add these extra burdens, but they won't even touch it with their finger. But all of their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and they love to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. It can be really confusing if you're not familiar with, uh, with phylacteries. They're small boxes uh, that the Jewish people would uh, fill with scripture and tie to left hand or left arm and uh, their heads. Small boxes being the key word. And uh, I guess the idea is if it's a bigger box, you can fit more scripture in it and it makes you more holy. Or maybe a bigger box and people from further away can see that you're wearing one and you're a man of God. It, it's a matter of pride. That's kind of the problem and that's what he's getting at here. They, they love to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi. They have these, these prideful labels. It goes on and says, uh, but do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. Again, we're, we're talking about labels here. He's not saying you can't call your dad father. He's saying that uh, these, these, these labels that these guys took on were for prideful reasons. They believed themselves to be somehow better and, and superior, and this is a problem. Uh, because God is the source of knowledge. So if these holy people of God are doing their job in interpreting, interpreting his law and passing it on to people and teaching them, they're not doing anything on their own. All they're doing is teaching people God's word. They're not making the law. They have nothing to do with that. But they love their labels. God is the source of knowledge and truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and life. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is his answer to their, their prideful behavior. Uh, break it down into two things. We have instructions, be humble, and a warning, you will be humbled. No choice, it's going to happen. So you can humble yourself voluntarily. Make sure you don't take on these absorbent titles. Make sure they don't go to your head. 
Or the Lord can humble you. That's probably going to be a little bit more painful. Now, at this point, here's where we start to get into the meat of the potatoes. He says uh, he's, he's getting into the woes, uh, as they're known. And if you know anything about uh, Scripture where the word woe appears, you want to pay very close attention. You don't want to be the recipient of that woe. It's not a good thing, not a good place to be. So he has some grievances with these uh, scribes and Pharisees that are about to come out. And they're important for us because while we're not by title scribes and Pharisees, these are behaviors that uh, are typical in people in general. And we can find those behaviors in our own behavior, in, in, in ourselves. So starting verse 13, uh, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And then, when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. What he says here is summed up by the blind leading the blind. These guys are taking these crazy laws and they're trying to make people follow these laws. They're lost themselves. These so-called so men of God who are supposed to be very familiar with the law and with the prophets. They're going through and they're adding things to it. They're manipulating it. And then they're teaching other people to do the same. That's not a woe that I would want to be guilty of. So we need to check ourselves and be very careful that when we are speaking for the Lord, we're really speaking for him. Because that's, uh, that's not a place you want to be. He continues, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold of the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For what is greater, the gift of the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it, and by all things. He who swears by the temple swears by it, and by him who dwells in it. And he swears by heaven, and swears by the throne of God, and by him who sits on it. A little hard to follow. They are making a vital mistake. They're putting value on things that we would normally put value on. Gold, for example. The gold is valuable. So they're promising on the, the gold in the temple, forgetting that this is, this is the house of God for them. There's something much, much bigger than gold. They're taking the Lord's name in vain. They're forgetting how powerful he is, who he is, that he is the creator of the universe. And they're taking these measly little things like gold and making that have some sort of value. Well, scriptures tell us that the streets in heaven are paved in gold. So we can see when you compare it to, to God, that's like putting your promise on asphalt. Not uh, nearly as important as they would like to think. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and NAs and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. I love that phrase. You picture somebody eating soup, and they find this tiny, itty-bitty little gnat in there. You know, if you're not looking, you might not even find it. I don't know. I'm, I'm probably one of the ones. I wouldn't even suspect anything of it. If it's a gnat, more protein. But they're, they're going through there, and they're straining out these tiny little things. They're making sure they've got the law just right, and they're following everything to, the, to a T, to the point where they're tithing their, their seasonings. Have you ever done that? I mean, I know there are plenty of us in here that'll take a certain percent off the top of our paycheck, but does anybody go through their spice cabinet, take 10% off the spice jars, and, and, and donate that? That's what these guys were doing. And he says that they're not wrong to do that. But the problem was, is while they're following everything to a T, they're forgetting the more important things. What's more important than tithing? Justice, mercy, and faith. They're not quite getting the intent of all of these laws. They're focusing on the words of the law and not actually what the law is to accomplish. He continues on, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish. But inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. 
blind Pharisee first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. We start kind of getting an idea here of what he's talking about. So we've got a couple of cups here. Who would like to drink a little bit of water out of the one on the left? No takers? Not even one? Okay. What about the one on the right? Oh, you know I'm going to trick you on the right, huh? See, it looks nice and clean, right? That one might make you a little sick. Both of them. Both of them are dirty, right? Jesus says, cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. clean. Let the Lord work on your heart. The law starts to take care of itself. Continuing on, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, if you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and uncleanliness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Everything looks fine on the outside until you take a look and see how sick you get. These guys looked like they were following the law, but they were hypocrites and lawless. It's a matter of the heart. They're tithing properly, they're following everything to the letter, but they're not doing things for God. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous, and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. They're saying that, you know, we, we, we know better. We wouldn't have persecuted the prophets. We wouldn't have killed the prophets. But Jesus calls them out. Therefore, you are witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murder the prophets, Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. They claim there's no blood on their hands, that they're right with God. And Jesus is saying, you are killing the men of God that he has sent out, the prophets. Now, in the end of the chapter, we get a little bit of insight on Jesus' reaction. This is, uh, this is a horrible chapter to read through when you, you, you see the anger of, of our Lord against these people. What's really horrible is realizing that we have some things in common, maybe not on the same level as they do, but we share some of those things in common, and it's kind of frightening. But here we get to see how Jesus actually reacts to it personally. He says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is lamenting the fact that he can't get them to change things around, that he can't get them to see this. He's calling them blind for that reason. He's frustrated and he's saddened. He wants nothing more than to take them under his wing like a mother hen. But he can't do that because they won't let him. So similar to chapter 5, where he says, you... you heard it said, but I say to you, he's calling out what the scribes and Pharisees are doing that is following the law, but then he's 
talking about how they're so much deeper. And here we get the, the, the better idea that it's more along their, their attitude towards it than it is their actual actions themselves. Now, in the same way, the scribes and Pharisees focus on the law and not the intent. But the law is important. We can't forget that. In fact, Matthew 5, uh, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So anybody that says we're not upheld to any part of the law at all, we can do whatever we want because Jesus forgave us, they're, they're getting kind of a muddy picture there. He didn't do away with the law, we still have rules and order that we're supposed to follow. Now, in Matthew 22, uh, some of the scribes and Pharisees, they like to play stump the chump with Jesus, except for he's not the chump by any means. They thought they knew so much about the law that they could trick him into saying certain things. You know, trick him into uh, condemning himself as, as having no idea what he's talking about. And uh, in chapter 22, they did exactly this. We're starting in uh, verse 34. He says, But when the Pharisees heard that he, Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asks him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? They're trying to stump him, right? There's a lot of commandments. He's asking him to pick one. Jesus doesn't miss a beat. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now keep in mind the environment going on here. They're trying to trick the Messiah. They don't really expect an answer here which is unfortunate because although they're trying to trick him, Jesus gave them quite possibly some of the most important, valuable information for us as believers. They probably didn't get it because they're trying to catch him in a trick. And they hear this and they're like, eh, okay, nothing we can get him on. Jesus taught them how to obey the law. He says this, this one commandment, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. And all the law and the prophets are hinged on that. I guess the modern day equivalent would be don't be a jerk, right? We have that one sign that sums up all these different rules, but if you just simply follow the nature of that law, what it was intended for, be nice to the people around you, be respectful for the people who own and operate the shops you go in, you don't even have to know what the signs are. You're not gonna leave crumbs behind, you're not gonna spill drinks, you're not gonna leave your kids to break stuff because you're being respectful and honorable. So the law is good, but we have one rule that covers all of it. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. So here's how that, uh, how that plays out. The law is meant to help us to act right and holy, but we fall short of that. We know that very well. We break the rules intentionally. We bend the rules, try to make certain things slide to the point where we even create new rules for other people. We even break rules on accident didn't even realize that that was offensive, but maybe, you know, it, it was an accident. We didn't even realize. But Jesus died for us, freeing us from the law. This is how that works. We can be forgiven for our sins. It's no longer a matter of violating one rule and suffering the penalty, which is death. The penalty of sin is death. We don't have to worry so much about breaking that one tiny little rule and suffering that penalty because the Lord will forgive us all we have to do is ask. We follow him. Our relationship with the Lord in coming to him cleans us from the inside out. Once the inside is clean, the outside is clean also. We love the Lord our God. We love our neighbor. And then all these crazy rules that took lawyers and crazy studies and people spending lifetimes to figure out What's the right amount to tithe at the right time and this and that? We don't have to worry about that. We have to love our God, love our neighbor, be led by the Holy Spirit, and we're going to follow those rules. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's what Jesus said. That's the final part of it. So it's sort of a chicken and egg sort of thing. Following the law as close as we possibly can and making sure we don't break one tiny little rule doesn't make us holy at all. We can't do it. We're incapable. 
We've broken something at some time. But with our relationship in Christ, he can make us clean on the outside. He can change our heart so that we will follow the law, so that we'll do the things that we're expected without even knowing what's written down. So a fan can be a follower of the law, but only a follower of Christ can be forgiven and clean on the inside. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for, for leading us. We thank you for Matthew 23. It, uh, it frightens us, Lord, to see your anger, but we know it is righteous anger, and we pray that uh, you change our hearts, you keep us on the right side of those woes, Lord. We pray that you would not uh, have to speak out to us in that anger, but Lord, if you do, please speak to our hearts so that we can change. Bring us close to you. Strengthen our relationship with you. Make us clean on the inside so that we can be clean on the outside for you. And we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me, please. I think we got a handle on this now. There we go. How are we doing? And I. find a way to show your word is true and none shall fear but all will know the measure of our Father's endless love consider all the works your hands have made great and small sea to mountain, passion of our great creator, King, whose glory shines in all created things, and on the earth, nation, tribe, and tongue, amazing grace extends to It was for these you died that all who call find eternal life.
gospel's power to save. Run this race. Run and not go. It's on to save. Jesus, mighty name, give me the faith that makes the song. All right, so challenge for this week, I would, uh, I would encourage you to look through scripture, mostly look through your heart. Take a look at the various different things that you do without question. Coming to church, any, uh, any tithes and offerings that you give, any, anything that you do because the Bible said so, and just look into your heart and see what is your motivation. Are you doing it because the Bible said so, or are you doing it out of respect and out of uh, being a, a true follower of Jesus. Are you answering his call? Follow me. And that's all. Nice and simple. Lots of prayer. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend and a great week. We'll see you uh, hopefully Wednesday, if not Sunday. Sunday.